Thank you. Um, I, I'm a sound recordist and I'm a freelance sound recordist. I work for anybody that pays me, basically. Um, a, a lot of my work is in broadcast, um, well, broadcast medium, so I work in feature films, in television, in radio, in broadcast terms. Most of that is for the BBC Natural History Unit, but through that I get hired out to work on productions for organisations like Discovery and National Geographic, um, which is where I get the privilege to do most of my travel, um, mostly in television, a lot in feature films and to a certain extent in radio. But as I was talking to the students this morning about one of the great things about sound, it allows me to work across lots of other mediums. So I work with an independent record label in London called Touch. I make CDs. I make um, radio programs for other um, web-based stations. Increasingly, I do a lot of installation work in galleries and some live performance of that work. Um, which is really interesting. I also do lots of workshops like the one I've been doing today. So I know the mind was saying this piece is titled In Britain's Footsteps and that refers to a commission that I was working on for the past 18 months and I did a performance of two weeks ago in Snake Maltings in the Benjamin Britten studio down in Albrook as part of the Benjamin Britten Centenary which is this year. Um, Benjamin Britten was born on December the 22nd, 1913. And so this whole year celebrating it. And I was commissioned by Jonathan Reeky, the chief executive, to make a sound work that tracked Britain's daily um, walks uh, in Britain's footsteps with the composing walks that Benjamin Britten described that he took every day. So I reflected upon the sounds around him. I'm a strong believer in that we're influenced by our soundscapes, good and bad, internal and external. And Benjamin Britten certainly took advantage of that. The man was a great listener, apart from being a great composer. So um, I'll play a short sample of that towards the end of the piece. But I want to talk about my work is, and what's interesting again, I mentioned to the students that. Um, I work across all these different mediums, but interestingly, the techniques that I've developed to make work for me in the field are the same. So the same elements that I use to gather sounds for a feature film will work for a radio program or an installation. So the end result might be different, um, but the means of gathering the recordings is quite often very similar. But there are differences to those techniques. Um, and with regard to one particular um, piece of work I was commissioned to do a couple of years ago, that's what I want to, to start talking about, and that's this idea of perspective. Something you cannot achieve in a studio, but it's something um, with regard to the location of the microphone relative to the source of the sound. And it's something that occupies me a lot. I think it's one of the most engaging things about listening to sound is this sense of perspective. And as I said, there's nothing I've come across yet that can create that, um, that sense in, um, in the studio. And what I mean by perspective is the relative distance from the source of the sound. So fortunately, throughout the scene, there's plenty of opportunities for me just to shut up and just play some sounds. If any of you, I did an interview actually for the Radio Times website, which they put up yesterday. Um, which is quite an interesting interview. It probably means I won't be working in television again. Um, so I was talking about the misuse of music in natural history films. Actually, before we start, does, does anybody think there's not enough music in wildlife films and television? Or that we need more of it? Good. So we're all sort of on the same wavelength. Um, this is a recording in the Mojave Desert. This is a wide angle, wide perspective sound. All the sounds you hear were a relatively long way from the microphone. And in the Mojave Desert, there's no built environment. There's virtually no vegetation. It's flat, of course, it's very hot, 44 degrees centigrade. It's relatively quiet, 
when um, they're not landing planes at LAX um, on the eastern runway. So it's relatively quiet, so you can <coughs> hear into the distance. This is something that we've lost a lot of in this country, but there are places left where you can hear that very distant, pers very distant perspective sounds. A lot of these sounds are recorded spatially with a surround technique which has been diffused into four channels. Very, that's a cactus dodger cicada which only starts when it gets over 40 degrees centigrade. This is a very simple sound, but it's this particular sound of the place. But very distant perspective. This is much closer. This is uh, <coughs> Michael. Yeah, my book's so up. Um, Do you need a projector at all? Yes, got two slides that, um, to show. Um, this is a much closer perspective recording, and this is in a much more dense environment. This is a tropical rainforest in Iguazu, um, on the border of Brazil and Argentina. So very dense foliage, uh, a lot more in terms of reverberation, coloration, and there are lots of things very close around the microphones. So much denser, much closer perspective. One thing I just decided to include at the last minute is a few <coughs> technical things that, that may be of interest to some of you. Um, thanks to Sean, Jules has just run over and brought over his parabolic reflector. Classic tool of any wildlife sound recordist is this device. Um, although this is a nice new polycarbonate one. This is a, a device that gives you acoustic amplification, a mechanical device. This is a very special curve, x equals y squared, a parabolic curve. If you fix a microphone at the focal point of this parabolic curve, any sound that comes in and hits the dish parallel to the axis will be reflected back to a common point, the focal point. If you put the capsule of a microphone there, then any sound that hits this dish, whether it's here, 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 or here, providing the sound is parallel to the axis, it will be reflected back to that common point. So a microphone capsule at that common point can collect sounds from a great distance. This has about a 10 or 12 degree pickup angle. I've seen photographs of Dr. Paul Kellogg using a much larger device than this in 1932 in Africa and Kenya. There is nothing that's been invented since that is more directional and more portable on locations. No digital device that will give you the same sort of acoustic amplification, noise-free amplification, no electronics involved. And I've quickly got a demonstration of the, the difference. This, that last recording was made with a spaced pair of these tiny personal microphones the sort of ones that you'll see tonight on News at 10 on newsreaders 
lapels and jackets and blouses. I can tell you for a fact there's much more interesting places to put these microphones other than on people. Um, but this, this, this recording was made with a pair of these microphones. Somewhere in that canopy, and you have to trust me, there's a, there's a bird singing called a pale-bellied thrush. I was with an ornithologist who identified it. We never saw this bird. So it was singing in the canopy, and it's singing on that chorus. And I wanted to get a recording of it. So I put down those two little Omni mics, picked my reflector up with a similar microphone in it, and made this recording within a couple of minutes of the last one. Same place, not a stereo spatial recording, but a fixed focus, close perspective mono recording of a bird I couldn't see. That's the difference. You can still hear the ambient, you can still hear the waterfall because low frequencies go straight through this. <clears throat> but what it does is effectively isolate like no other system, there's no gun microphone, no other directional system can achieve results better than that. And two opposite ends of the spectrum, wide angle ambient stereo with two omnidirectional microphones and very fixed focus, close up sound in mono with one of these. Um, I also spend a lot of time, sort of hotels, the BBC put me up in. And there's usually lots of these in the cardboard box in the corner. Um, this is really useful, as I've again been explained to the students today, to put a pair of these either side of a coat hanger and you have a really good spatial sound recording system. It's very cheap, very cost effective, of course, and lightweight. You can hang this on a banana leaf or straighten the handle out and put it in a beach. It's really effective. And I spend a lot of time wandering around <coughs> places recording like this, super lightweight. Um, these microphones are very flexible, but they do have the limits. This is quite a loud sound, and it will be. Listen for the click. until I played the recording back, was the electrostatic discharge for the click. <coughs> that, then the bang. What's interesting is that the bang is not the loudest part of that recording. The loudest part of the recording we can't hear because it's infrasonic. It's below our frequency of hearing. But the microphone still responds to it. These microphones are mechanical devices. They have a capsule in it which is moved by varying air pressure and that movement just creates a voltage which generates eventually the sound. So they're pushed and pulled by varying air pressure. The bang of that thunderbolt, this mic tiny microphone can cope with it. What it can't cope with is the infrasonic fallout of the thunder which rolled across the floor and passed through me. I couldn't hear it, could maybe feel part of it but it pushes the microphone, it's quite a key, geeky technical thing, but it pushes the capsule of this microphone to its backstop. This poor little capsule can't go any further. It physically displaces it to its limit, which means that's the loudest part of the recording, but we can't hear it, but you hear the resulting distortion. And so I'll just play the bang again.
that's the sound of that capsule crying for help <laughs> to be pushed by the front to the backstop. So it's interesting, the only time I've ever had to sort of reach the physical limit of these microphones. Um, so recording the sounds of spaces and then applying them to my productions, because I work in television, which is sort of short-term reality, if you like, so you get a whole life cycle of an animal or a place compressed into 50 minutes. Quite often the sound editing has to reflect that, and particularly with things like time compression um, or time-lapse cinematography, where you see um, clouds rushing past or the sort of the moon spanning the sky in 30 seconds. So I was always interested to work with producers to give them a soundtrack that would reflect that, rather than just resorting to the CD tray uh, to play some music over. So I came up with this idea of trying to make time compressions in sound which would reflect a different time scale of image. I then went on to develop it in other things. And we've just got a couple of examples of that. So quite often, I worked years ago, I worked on a series called Life of Birds. And um, there was a dawn chorus sequence where you see our dawn chorus, in, in our latitudes, I live in Newcastle, down in Rome, I mean, 55, 56 degrees north, we have the absolute best dawn chorus in the world. You know, I've travelled the world, I've listened to it in many places. These latitudes have the best, most vibrant, richest dawn chorus. We're very lucky, and we're coming up to that now. So start putting your heads out of your bedroom at four in the morning, and you'll hear the most amazing wildlife sounds anywhere on this planet. You don't have to go to the tropics or to the poles. Just be aware of what's in your back garden. Even St George's Square here, we did a dawn chorus piece a couple of years ago, which was, was really stunning that the students uh, produced. Anyway, so with Phil, um, the dawn chorus lasts about 90 minutes. Of course, in film terms, we see it evolve in 90 seconds on television. Um, and trying to create a soundtrack would reflect that. I simply started by overlapping, making a recording over 90 minutes, and overlapping sequences to reflect the dynamics and the transition and the change in density and texture of the, of the sounds. So this is a 90 minute dawn chorus in less than 90 seconds. This is, uh, we use this in, um, or a version of this in uh, uh, Life of Birds. Just a stereo recording. And maybe the woodland in Northumberland. minutes is a fair time to compress things to, but then <coughs> things often change in television at a different rate. Um, and so this is several hours in less than 90 seconds. This is the insect chorus in Kentucky, where we did made a series called Life in the Undergrowth. So this is the short evolution of the insect chorus from 6pm until about midnight. 
What in, I think is interesting about sounds like this is, you know, rarely would we ever stand still and listen to the sound of the place for five hours. But making selective recordings, maybe 20 recordings over that period, and segueing the tracks, you get this idea of impression on how dramatic the sound of the place changes. Something that we're not normally aware of because we're simply we don't work in those time frames, we wouldn't stand there and listen to something, listen to a place for five hours. Not that we have to tonight. So this is about 6 p.m. And then finally, I did. A, I worked on a series called Frozen Planet, um, which went out probably about 18 months ago. And there's one sequence in Antarctica at the end of the Austral summer where the sea freezes. And we were down there for a few weeks as it was starting to happen, but in the space of less than a minute, <coughs> you saw the ocean tr transform from a, um, a liquid into a solid. So it was really interesting to represent that. That's something that takes three months um, to try and represent that in a minute. For that, I used a lot of hydrophone recordings, um, which we get the chance I'll play a bit later. So that's their microphones that record um, underwater. But they also work very well in ice, where you're recording, using them as geophones, recording the sounds through a solid when the sea starts to freeze. So this is a representation um, that was used in the programme of the sea freezing, transforming from a liquid to a solid. Outside of broadcast, which is um, 
so it's something I spend a lot of my time doing, but um, <coughs> much more interesting, much more challenging for a lot of my work are some of the other commissions I get. I talked about the Britain's piece, but this for me was one of the most interesting in recent years, um, and one sort of least expected. Can you turn the lights on? Um, the curator called Nicola Freeman, who was at the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square, got in touch with me. Um, um, 18 months ago, and invited me down to talk about creating some sound works to go to some paintings in the National Gallery because principally they were interested in engaging people for longer with the paintings. There were 3,000 paintings in the National Gallery, Trafalgar Square. The average time anybody spends in front of any of them, whether it's a Turner, Monet, Constable, whoever, is four seconds. So they were thinking of ways to engage people for longer in the paintings. And Nicola, I mean, came up with that, I thought it was an amazing idea. I mean, I've done occasional bits of work with Tate, but I've never, never, this is an inspired idea, quite a contemporary idea from a gallery um, that stopped collecting paintings in the, in the start of the 19th century. Um, and so I was invited to choose any painting in the National Gallery and create a soundtrack for it. And this is John Constable's The Cornfield, painted in about 1826, I think. And it has really relevance to the Britain thing, because this is in Suffolk, of course, um, in, inland from, from Alborough. So I was invited to make a sound work with a view to engaging people a little bit longer with the painting. Um, and, and what interested me was the thing I started off talking about this evening, perspective. Um, and fascinating once you start to look at the history of a painting like this. Constable painted this from memory in his studio in London in about 1826, 1827, I think. But as a child, he used to, this is part of Suffolk, um, used to walk to school through this place, but he painted it from, from memory. And he wanted to make a painting that would sell, he needed the money, um, he had a family, he was short of cash, and so he painted something that was going to be like a, a chocolate box, you know, a cake tin, something attractive. Um, and so he painted one of the most, what he thought, you know, was sort of inviting, attractive scenes, which is this memory from his childhood in sort of early summer of the cornfield. Um, it then went on an exhibition round around the country for sale for lots of other paintings and nobody bought it. Um, when he died, he still had it in the studio, and his um, estate got together, and the friends of the estate, and they donated, um, they, they got 300 guineas that they collected for it, paid that into his estate, and um, donated the painting to the National Gallery. So 300 not quid for the film to. Um, an amazing history, really, about it. But what engaged me immediately was this sense of perspective. I could hear things when I thought about painting, so that's what interested me. Um, and what I'll do is just a basic breakdown of it. And this is a dreadful um, copy of the image, so I apologise for that. We I mean, go and see the original. And in fact, when I, I did make this piece, I was invited to present this, I've done it three times in front of the original painting in the National Gallery. They have these, again, these great nights, Friday evenings when the gallery closes. There's no charge, we can stay on. And they have these other events. And they had this three times when people would sit in front of the painting, an art historian would guide you through the painting, and then I would talk about my aspect of perspective and then play the track. That's quickly what I'd, I'd like to do. What interested me about this painting, first of all, is the framing. Um, so, you know, it's a bit like sound design for a film, but for a single image. You can see these trees, including this silver birch, or whatever it is, with, with dead leaves and trees. So the first thing I thought of...
was that. The those trees frame the image. Wind through trees, including sort of dry and dead birch branches. And then the chorus of canopy birds, which you can't see, but I'm sure are up there singing. And then this. This painting was originally called The Drinking Boy. It's quite clearly a stream or a spring there which that boy is drinking from as he's either going to or moving some sheep. And then this, a bird which I saw in St George's Square this afternoon. Very secretive bird, the jay. It's up somewhere in the branches. I've got a border collie at home, like that one, and I know that she can be very easily distracted from sheep <clears throat> if she gets a bit bored. What that border collie's looking at, she's lost, she's not paying attention to the sheep, because what she's heard is a great, great spotted woodpecker drumming on that dead <laughs> trunk. Two things I refuse to record and have done several times. One is sheep and the other one's chickens. Um, so there are no sheep in this soundtrack because they've got the moving away from us. What there is is a seasonal shift. So what we've heard is all around the periphery. What Constable's done beautifully, of course, what he was a great artist at doing, is drawing one's eye into the far distant perspective. So I imagine that people, in order to perhaps engage people with this painting, you first of all browse the outer edges, you look at the frame, which are these trees, you look at some of the foreground detail, and then your eye, obviously, cleverly, is drawn to the far distance. So that's the way the soundtrack moves. But in doing that, the seasons change, so there's a time shift as well, like some of the tracks I've been trying to demonstrate that through earlier. What happens now is you look towards the cornfield and it's no longer that sort of springtime canopy but it's becoming drier and warmer. It's got a more summery feel. So there's, there's insects in the foreground by the cornfield and the bird song is greatly reduced as it is in summer. That's the sound of the cornfield. Just dry, ripe corn stems rubbing together in a breeze, a summer breeze. In, when my constable was going to school, I guess in the um, 18th century, um, not only could he see into the distance, like we can today in those parts of Suffolk, he could hear into the distance. What we're continually plagued by now, in the 21st century, is noise pollution. So, the soundscape of this place, this place is believed to exist what is fictional is the village that it painted um, in, the, um, in the distant background. But this scene in the footpath are said to exist. Um, so you can see into the distance. 
Um, you cannot now, in any part of Suffolk or in most parts of this country, in Britain, hear into the distance because of noise pollution. Something which was unknown to, in Suffolk, and certainly uh, to Constable when he lived in Suffolk. Perhaps it was in, starting to encroach in London. But these days, and I went to some, I went to some locations in Suffolk to make these recordings, because a lot of my work, the integrity of the content is important to me. Um, so that was a Suffolk cornfield. But a lot of the time, um, these were the sounds that plagued me, like, like they plague us most days. And interesting, there's a, there's a link there to, a tenuous link, to Benjamin Britten, because it was the sound of aircraft that drove Benjamin Britten out of his house, the Red House, the famous, famous um, house on the edge of Alborough um, in the 1960s. Britain was a pacifist, and during the Second World War, he was in America with Peter Pierce, and he came back um, in the 1950s, and they moved to the Red House on the outskirts of Alborough, he was quite a private man, he was getting um, his sort of collar felt and sort of people, too many people approaching him in the town of Alborough where he lived, so they moved out. Unfortunately, it was at the height, height of the Cold War, late 1950s, early 1960s, and the American Air Force <coughs> were given a base by the RAF at Bentwaters, about two miles um, to the west of the Red House. So, during the early 1960s, every day over Benjamin Britten's house were American tank busters, A-10 aircraft, and heavy bombers turning over Alborough to land. That was a jet engine, but the, um, those noises drove Benjamin Britten out of his house. I mean, the man was a composer, he was a, a great listener, as I discovered, as well as being a pacifist, and so he was driven out of his house by the noise of military aircraft which is one of the great pervading things and the thing that's destroyed the tranquility these days of Suffolk. And he moved to a place um, that wasn't in the path of aircraft. Nevertheless, in Constable's day, above this field, undoubtedly, there would have been a skylark. Skylarks are some of the wide, most widely distributed birds in Britain. And certainly, in the 19th century, there was a great population of them in uh, mixed habitat like this, very low intense agriculture. And so there would, I'm, sh I'm certain, would be nests around the edge of this um, cornfield. And the males are singing to defend the territory and to, um, uh, to keep their mates on the nest somewhere at the edge of the cornfield. Interesting, it's a bird you hear a lot late spring, or from now really, up until summer, but one you can rarely see. These amazing single silver pinpoints of sound that get lost to sight. classic finch of summer cornfields and arable lands. Again, somewhere out of sight. So this church Tower doesn't exist as a fiction, so it had to feature in the soundtrack. Mm. 
And that was the most difficult sound to record <coughs> because I had to record it at a distance. Because I said at the, I said at the start, you can't create perspective in sound. So I had to find a church in Suffolk, and I was down there, stand miles away and wait for the bells to toll and hope there was no aircraft or traffic or tractors or mopeds or whatever. That, that took the longest to record, those few seconds. Um, if you bear with me, I'll play the track. So this is what was presented in the gallery. One thing that interests me, which is still tantalizingly unavailable in broadcast work, is working with surround sound. Um, the sounds of spaces interest me as much as the sound of the animals that inhabit them. Because I think it was that you, know, you want to convey the sense and spirit of place in sound. Um, the closest thing is to use, to the most eloquent way of doing it is to let it speak for itself. Um, and for me, it's far better if you can generate um, or recreate the sound of a space. And stereo really just doesn't do it. Um, we don't hear the world like that. We don't hear the world in surround sound, which is a closer approximation to it. So I've done lots of work trying to investigate ways in which can create, record the sounds of animals in spaces. Um, and this is a very simple way. I first started trying to do it by using not two of these, but by four of them in a small quad, a small square. Um, and by doing that, one technique, again, something you were talking about today, this afternoon, is <coughs> by having a small microphone spacing and playing back over a wider system. 
you can enlarge the sense of space effectively. Well, this is a recording of a small pond in northern India in the Kola Tiger Reserve um, at dusk. There's some very tiny frogs called skipper frogs, the size of my sort of thumbnail. But they inhabit these tiny ponds and they come out in the evenings and they have this spectacular sort of jumping, calling display, but in quite small spaces. But what I like about doing pieces like this and what transcends broadcasting is that you can create the sound of this space. And effectively, that small, small pond, we're all now in the middle of it because we're surrounded by these speakers. Very simple system, four identical microphones, just in a square, recorded and played back like that. So each speaker represents one microphone. But there's an overlap between all the speakers because the microphones are quite close together. It's just a great sound as well, I think. One of the places that's been most interesting for sound is not through air but through water and also later through ice with a um, frozen planet. Sound travels in seawater, sound travels almost five times faster than through air. It's a very efficient medium for sound and vibrations. Um, so I was keen to experiment with underwater sound recording using an array of hydrophones. So like those small um, uh, <coughs> microphones in a quad array using four hydrophones in an array. And that literally opened up to another world of sound. Our oceans, I mean, we you know, arrogantly think we live on <coughs> planet Earth, and of course we don't, we live on planet ocean. 70% of our planet is occupied by the oceans. It is without doubt the most sound-rich habitat we have. Everything in the water Everything that's been discovered, according to Chris Clark from Cornell, um, that they want to use as sound. There are no deaf sea animals. Um, visibility is reduced. So they live in a world of sound and vibration. Um, and the sad thing is, we're filling up their world with our anthropogenic noise from shipping and oil exploration and seismic um, investigations. Um, when I was recording for Frozen Planet, um, I, was, I was recording all pods of orcas, killer whales, great pods of them, 200 animals coming up the ice leads in the frozen Ross Sea when the cracks open up, living in the darkness, communicating with echolocation and vocalisation. Great social groups, amazing animals, the range of a third larger than ours. Um, and, and navigating the way up using, living with sound, using it to communicate with them, to hunt as well, hunting penguins and weddell seals in the darkness. I was recording them until the point that the icebreaker came into the channel to carve a way up to McMurdo, the American Science Foundation base, to, um, up to resupply it for the winter. I had to stop recording when the icebreaker was over 20 miles away from my hydrophone because the noise was deafening. Um, and those animals have no choice but to stay in it. So, you know, we think we have it bad stuff with the noise pollution with aircraft and music play at us everywhere. But in the sea, it's becoming a significant problem. Anyway, it, there are some amazing sounds, even the mechanical sounds 
of water and currents. This is a bed of kelp from the surface. And this is the same kelp recorded with hydrophones. What I like about sounds like this is the familiarity with the strangeness to them as well. One of the things, certainly one of the things that appeals to me about underwater sounds is that very rich harmonic structure. It's a very basic, simple sound, a mechanical sound of the sea underwater sloshing weed around. But to me, there's a familiarity with it. I worked on a radio program made a few years ago called A Small Slice of Tranquility. And in that, I discovered that our sense of hearing developed when we're 16 weeks old in our mother's womb. That's when we first hear. So the first sounds that we hear are percolated through amniotic fluid. We hear underwater our first sounds. That's the way we perceive the world, our mother's voice through the womb and through that environment. So I'm, you know, I, I think it's a very good argument, a constructive argument, that what sounds that we consider tranquil and relaxing hark back perhaps to the sounds that we heard before we were even born. Which is why maybe sea wash on the beach or underwater sounds have that particular effect on us. What people say these are tranquil, not soporific, but sort of tranquil sounds. And that's possibly one reason why. This is one of the coldest, most scariest um, sounds I've recorded, basically because I can remember the place where I made it. Um, I worked on a series about the Galapagos Islands. And uh, I've always wanted to record the sound of the open ocean from the surface with no other sound, no boat noise, no people. It's quite difficult. When you're on a boat, you can't record the sound of the ocean because of the slap of water on the hull of the boat. So we were on a boat staying uh, off an uninhabited island, Darwin Island in the Galapagos. And, um, there were some exposed rocks. This is the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. And I said, this is after a few drinks after dinner at night, I said, it'd be really good now to go and get the sound of the ocean because there's no shipping and it's really calm. So Patrick, the director, said, well, I'll take you out to this rock. So I said, yeah, great. So <laughs> we got totally dangerous. We were out of this dinghy to this rock about the size of this room. And I scrambled out with my gear to the Pacific lapping all around. He went away and said, I'll come back in an hour and left me <laughs> at sort of midnight. Amazing starscape. But I recorded on the surface of this rock the sound as close as I've ever got to just the sound of the Pacific Ocean with nothing else as far out in the Pacific Ocean as I've been. contrast was the remarkable thing that ear opened for me was at the, well, shortly after that putting my array of four hydrophones into the waters of the Pacific uh, going about 10 metres down so a quad array of hydrophones and recording this this incredible dense curtain of sound and this is one particular animal these are pistol shrimps and there's lots of 
species of pistol shrimp in the family, but basically these are shrimps that have asymmetric claws. They have one massive claw, one regular size one, and they use their oversized claw as a weapon, as a sonic weapon. So they wait for something tasty. They're about two centimetres long. They wait for something tasty to swim past, and they snap their giant claw shut so fast it creates cavitation underwater, it creates a vacuum. And as the water <laughs> collapses into the vacuum, this tiny bubble, it stuns or kills uh, these nearby tasty morsels. So they're using this, this sonic weapon. Um, at night in the Pacific, as in lots of other oceans, I've recorded this sound from the Arctic Ocean to the South Atlantic. At night, when it's dark, um, the light level goes, these shrimps rise in the millions from the depths to start feeding on the plankton on the surface, which again obviously draws up all the other, other predators. What fascinated me about this is the first recording I made, and then subsequently on my travels, I recorded them, let's say, in the Arctic Oceans, right down to the South Atlantic. This is the signature sound of our planet. This is the commonest animal sound on our planet. You know, it, and yet we rarely hear it unless you're a diver. So you know, if, we, if we ever need to send the sound into space of the sound of this planet, I think this is it. It's the signature of our planet, and it's a tiny animal, a pistol shrimp. The grunting sounds of fish, fish communication, fish communicate with the swim bladder. So I grew up as a teenager watching uh, Jacques Cousteau's Silent World, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so I enjoyed watching, I enjoyed watching the TV class scientists jumping off of Calypso as a 16 year old. <laughs> this is another um, effect <coughs> of temperature which a very basic sound, but I'm really pleased to get the chance to play it. Um, this is the Serengeti in Tanzania, where I was there working on a project last year, a film project, and I wanted to record just the sound of the Serengeti grasslands at sunrise with those very distant acacia trees. Most of those trees, apart from that one, are a kilometre away. But what happened that morning, something I've never ever, I've, I've read about and I know the effect, I've never heard it, it's a temperature inversion effect. I've heard it at sunset, but I've never heard it at sunrise. What happens is, in, during a temperature inversion, is a layer of cold air is trapped near the earth by a layer of humid, warm air, and it creates a barrier through which sound finds it very difficult to penetrate. So normally during the day, sound, as well as being going horizontal, will go up, straight up. Anybody who's been in a hot air balloon knows how well you can hear sounds on the ground. So sound will go up as well as out to the sides and at an angle. During a, a system where you have temperature inversion, sound will hit um, this change in temperature and the dense, humid layer and be reflected back down. So you hear things from a long way away. And I've heard this at night and a lot of animals make use of this at night. Hyenas, for instance, in, in, um, I'm sure have evolved their howls. They howl into the ground and I'm sure lions are the same thing. You know, they communicate at these times because their message goes further. It's the first time I've heard this temperature inversion. I was actually 
after it, she was quite excited about this. Because I could realise as soon as I switched the microphones on, what I couldn't hear were the insects in the grassland and extremely distant sounds that I was hoping to hear. But in fact, I was hearing sounds of the dawn chorus in these trees. So this is a, a spaced a surround sound recording. Most of those birds are a kilometre away, at least. It really shouldn't sound like that, trust me. It should be very quiet. What I also like about it is this sort of special aspect to it. Finally, I'll just say about a little bit about Britain's uh, piece because that used some of the same spatial techniques. Um, the commission I got to record Benjamin in Britain's footsteps was 18 months ago, so I went out with a similar sort of microphone, a surround microphone, and took the same walks that Benjamin Britain took daily. I had a very formal routine. I know this because I got to interview Rita Thompson, his nurse, who still lives in Albrook. She's the lady who nursed Britain for his last sort of 10, 12 years. Um, and she, so she was really useful and, and, and really generous with the time and <coughs> information. Benjamin Britain would work in the mornings. Um, he would get up at you know, so breakfast at 8, sit down, work all morning um, on his compositions, whatever he was working on, and then put a jacket and tie on sit down and have lunch very f every day, very formal, even when he was on his own, just with Rita. He'd then get up, get changed and go for a walk. And he, he called these walks his composing walks. And he said, he's frequently quoted, I work whilst I'm walking. So it was a vital part of this process. It wasn't just to, you know, to get out. He was very careful where he went. He chose, because they'd moved away from the town of Auburn, because he was getting bothered basically by people, he became, became very famous. He would choose these um, green lanes and holloways away from the coast in Suffolk and go for walks and consider his morning's work, but also listen to the sounds around him in a way that I think inspires creative thought or even problem solving. Um, we all, you, know, you all know what I'm talking about, that when you, you need to think about something, whether it's creatively or problem solving, um, to get out somewhere and have a sound that doesn't intrude, an ambient level of sound upon which you can rest your thoughts. And he often described that as being a vital part of his compositional process. I don't think, uh, I can't hear his music, and I don't know his music that well, I've listened to a lot of it, but. Um, unlike Messier and composers like that who tried to notate her song, Britain didn't do that, I'm convinced. It was influenced by soundscape, as we all are, and particularly during these walks. And he took them um, throughout the seasons, so I made the point, I was there uh, up and down from Newcastle to over, over 18 months recording to the seasons. Um, a sense of place was also very important to Benjamin Britain. He didn't roam far, he just went out for an hour or so, but through this mosaic of Suffolk habitats, heathland, deciduous woodland, reed beds and marshes, wild places, then and still to a certain extent now. He also knew the bird song. I know that because Rita, who's not interested in birds or bird song, knows them. She, she can tell me what a willow warbler sounds like, or a wood warbler, or a song thrush, or a robin, or a chip chat because Benjamin Britten taught her. And somebody who can do that is very clearly a very careful listener, apart from being a great composer. So that really you know, struck me because that's something that I'm interested in doing. So when I, was, I took his, the same walks of his in Britain's footsteps through the same sort of seasons and tried to record and document 
the sounds of the places and the sounds he would have heard because it's still relatively unindustrialized there. It's still, because it's mostly nature reserves now, there's no, still no intensive arable farming. It's not quite the same as in Constable's day because of the aircraft. Nevertheless, you can get that feeling of what it was like 50 or 60 years ago when Britain was taking those wars. The interesting thing is, and perversely, for somebody who records wildlife and makes installations, is that what I included in the piece was a lack of sound. Because that ambient, very quiet ambient, is equally important. Bass line, it's called in conventional music. It's the background ambient. It goes back to the foundation soundtracks that we were talking about this morning. But there are lots of featured sounds, signature sounds. I'll just briefly play a couple of pieces. This is Aldborough Churchyard, where, of course, Benjamin Britten and Peter Pears are buried. In winter. But recorded with a spatial aspect. I had a notion when I put this piece together, rather like me and Cockney, who lived in Alborough, everything you heard during the day on these walks was in the sound of the church bells at Alborough Parish Church. So by the summertime, when I got um, a mile away from the parish church, I made recordings a bit like what I was trying to do for the cornfield of very distant bells. So in each of the seasonal aspects, from winter to autumn, of the sound of Albert Parish church bells from distant perspectives. The other really important signature sound was a bird, um, Benjamin Britten's favourite bird, and a favourite bird of lots of composers and musicians, a nightingale. And Rita told me that um, he used to wait, you know, quite excitedly wait in late April for the first nightingales to come back. Uh, there's some gardens in the Red House. <coughs> And I went there to record on April the 14th last year to record an early dawn chorus in the grounds of the Red House. And I went at 2.30 in the morning, set some microphones up in some bushes, I ran them back to the car, it was minus two degrees centigrade, and waited for the first bird to sing, I heard owls and a distant fox. And then at 4 a.m. the first bird sang. It was a remarkable moment because it was a nightingale. <coughs> Um, and nightingales migrate at night. They usually turn up in sort of the third or last week in April, but this was April the 14th. It was a male that must have come down in the gorse, in the golf course by the Red House and started singing. So it was a really powerful moment to record that. I got a very distant recording and a much closer perspective recording. And I was listening to some of Britain's music at the time, in particular his cello suites. And I noticed <coughs> that, in fact, the cello, one of his cello suites, the two in in particular, the second suite, doesn't sound like a nightingale, but it has the phrasing of a nightingale. So when we did the performance at Snape, um, I asked Oliver Coates, the cellist, to play along with Chiang Connor to um, a mix of this nightingale recording. I don't have the, I won't use a recording of this, I won't have the chit, I'll play. Um, the recording I made from the grounds of his house
And in fact, this is a mix of Nightingale and John Chorus. A bit loud. You can take the surround signal out. That's the recording I made in the, in the ground of the camp. Echo 14. Mono recording, one microphone. Thank you for listening.
the assistant and the door and the side system. <coughs> But you can get out, make your own recordings. I've made a few recordings, and I'm, I'm going to build a portfolio. And is, is there any way, is there something you can submit it to, you know, for, for it to be used, you know, not even to be paid, just to... I would say, first of all, we'll try and look at the radio station, but look at because yeah. all the players, the top 40 of phone is to guarantee it, you know, and a news report from the roundabout somewhere. So if you can take in something, you know, local, it's original, with interesting content will buy your hand off. Okay? And that's the way to get recognised. Because those those programmes, um, whatever, there must be a radio agenda or there must be a BBC station. I don't mean the little independent stations just play music, but the local BBC station, I'll start there. And they then get circulated and eventually the producer will pick that up. You know, and say, well, you know, where's this come from? You know, is this time? Yeah. That's a good way in. And of course they won't pay it, but they'll love it, you know. And, and, um, so they'll, they'll give you a little swap, you know. And then you sort of find your way into things. Thank you. What is it used for track and recording? Is it a sound devices for it? Yeah, it is a four channel sound devices, yeah. They yeah, have been used for a long time. I'm just looking at it some more, but um, the sound site's one. And is your way able to do the sound for the sound devices? Works really well. Yeah. Yeah, because they use the line in course. Yeah. Um, yeah, it works really well. Yeah, um, I was surprised actually with the sound field. So the first place I took it to, to was the sound pole. Mm. And I was surprised it worked. Mm -hmm. it didn't you know? No, I did. It, <laughs> <was right. laughs> no, it worked out to minus 44 degrees centigrade. I recorded it. Where the liquid on the surface of your eyeballs freezes. You take the goggles off. The microphone before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wondered if you'd ever recorded a sound that you had absolutely no idea what it was. Because some of the, the sounds you played were quite alien to my ears. Obviously, you explained the context. Was there anything you ever recorded and you still don't know what it was? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure I have. Yeah. yeah, particularly in the tropics, like the rainforest, you don't see anything, you hear everything. Um, <coughs> so yes, I mean, you, you were talking this country, apart from very esoteric migrant birds, or, you know, um, but in the tropics, a lot, and there's a lot of things, and most things aren't even identified yet. I mean, fewer birds, but insects all the time. You know. I was in Cameroon um, uh, a couple of years ago in cloud birds, <coughs> and I recorded some frogs and, and went back. I was a long way up this track, three kilometres, really sort of, I went back down and played them to the scientists who were working with them. And I said, oh God, God did, he, did he pick one up, did he keep one? And I said, no, you know, he said, oh, he should have done this because we were doing some research up here last year and we found 12 amphibians that were new to science, you know, <laughs> that were not recorded, you know, so there's loads of stuff. But the thing is, nobody can identify them. Yeah. I'm not saying if I can't, nobody can, but I mean, I play them to the scientific community. And a lot of them say, that's amazing. Yeah, I say, what is it? It's have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just thinking about your output on touch. And I think apart from outside the circle of fire, a lot of the other things seem to be very compositional as opposed to outside the circle of fire, there's like quite individual sounds, a bit more like, you know, not documentary, but you know what I mean, it's in the documented that sound, not much was done compositional-wise afterwards. Now, what I was thinking is that, do you find that there's something to be gained working with visual media, like as in, with Attenborough, and just documenting things that you can't do? Like, what is, like, there must be a merit there that's not in composing. What I, like, what I like about film yeah. is it's a, if it, when it's done properly, it's a, it's a collaboration, mm -hmm. and I really like that. You know. um, but I get to do both. I, I really enjoy the solitary aspect of being out there on my own, totally responsible for what I do. So when you put headphones on, nobody else can hear the world like you, even when you're with a film crew. But, um, but what I like is the collaborative process of filmmaking, when it's done properly. Not often not is, but you know you get the chance to contribute everything sacrificed to the end result. You know? 
and I enjoy that. What I also like, really like genuinely, is doing things like this, where I made those recordings on location, but then you come back and broadcast them in the widest sense to people who are actually in the same room, not at the end of a television set. Mm -hmm. So you get a much better sense of engagement, I think, that way. But I like, you know, like the solitary aspect of recording. I like the collaborative aspect of television, and particularly radio with the smaller group. But I like also that end sort of user being able to play either in an installation, mm -hmm. performance, or something like this. It's one of the great things about sound; it's so flexible. I mean, it's interesting what you say that about outside the circle of fire because they are. They're not edited, but they are composed pieces in terms of the length and the, mm -hmm. you know, they're very carefully arranged. Perhaps not, they're not layered in a compositional that's sense. Right, I didn't quite want to use the word documentary, but that's what, as opposed to something like, not in no one's name, but other things seem a lot more, yeah, as you said, layered. Yeah, 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 that's true, yeah. But they were individual sounds, mm -hmm. you know, they had that sort of singular impact, I think. Okay, well, yeah. Well, bring the hand into the recording. Have you done any, any experimentations with, with actually recording within, within 3D? Yes, all the time. That's what the sound field does. But we can't play it here. You need a third order and a sonic system. And in fact, that's what we did at Snake. <coughs> I worked with um, those recording I played you of Albert Parish Church is made with a sound field microphone. That was a B format recording. I can show you afterwards in here, but I've decoded it to, to quad, um, so that the, the height information is not there. But on the microphone, the software, you can tilt the microphone up and down as well as spin it around. And um, I work with Tony Myatt, who's got a great title now, he's Professor of Sound at Surrey University. Um, and he's probably the world leader in, in sort of specialising, creating spatial sound design. So I worked with him and he put in a third order of the sonic system to have 20 channels, 12 horizontal, four in the ceiling and four on the floor delayed. And when you hear those bells to that system, you, you hear them up here. You know, and the, the, this tower is sort of, there's a, an image on the of the tower. It works really well. It's incredibly accurate at localizing mm -hmm. and because they, it's so um, the way the capsules are arranged and sort of time on them. Yes, it's really effective, but you have to have a system. You know, so there's a few places where you can do it. But when you, you can, it's great and it works. Do you think they'll get more common on being able to use systems like that and have them replayed? Yeah, it's really, it's really exciting time, I think. Uh, and again, I'm starting to assume that. BBC at Salford are actively investigating, or well, some of you from the AS might know this, they're actively investigating um, transmitting surround sound through iPlayer, not through um, um, terrestrial or digital transmissions, but through iPlayer, <coughs> looking at software to make it available so you can download something. Obviously, you need the hardware at home, um, but first of all, it will be through headphones and then through a those people who've got the hardware who be able to uh, spatialise. So they've actually they broadcast a few things. I mean, again, I'm telling students that a programme that's not known as being bastard in the avant-garde, the lessons of nine, nine lessons and carols from King's College, Cambridge, for the last two years have been broadcast in an experimental surround format, just as tests for the people that sold it. So it is happening. Well, that's why I was encouraging the sound design students to, to get involved with it. And they're using ambisonic techniques. So, you know, they're going back you know, to basic, you know, middle and side techniques, which is, this, which is ambisonic, um, just but with high. So, Alan kind of Bloodline's techniques from 1930, you know, are being used today to, uh, for surround sound broadcasting. So, it's really exciting. Games manufacturers. We're actually looking at the sonic decoders for specialising games to put you in those um, environments. So yeah, and I think because it got lost in the 70s because it was the analog processing, but now it's all being digitised. It's, it's really taking taking on sort of 
a new currency and people picking it up. And with new microphones like the new, new sound field, you know, the prospects are great. Can I just ask quickly, like, um, have you noticed uh, a difference in the, say, like your first sound recording you ever done? Uh, and so you go back to the place now, do you notice a uh, difference in the sounds in terms of is there less birds you can hear or? Well it's different, I think Bernie Krauss has done a lot of work, if you know him well, Sanctuary, in California. Um, yeah, I mean I've got recordings, that, interestingly, yeah, I've got recordings at home. Well when we, uh, we had twins and I was at home one summer and they were like 18 months old and I was on looking after the trees you can see in the garden. So I used to quite often put a microphone up and just record ambient sound in the garden. And I recorded loads of house sparrows. And I then worked on a Radio 4 program which needed some urban garden sounds. And I recorded our garden two years ago. And out of interest, compared it to our garden sound over 10 years ago. It was astonishing. There's no house sparrows now in our Part of the world. I don't know what it's like here. They effectively disappeared. There used to be dozens and dozens, and, and now there's one or two. So I've noticed that a lot in my back garden. So I'm sure. You know, but whether that's that's just a cyclical change, you know, I don't think you can assess it over ten, over ten years, unless the habitat's gone. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, what recording technique did you use? Uh, and microphone placement technique did you use for the thunder? The thunder? It was yeah. those two little ominous on a coat <coughs> yeah. I did it once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so those two tiny spaced ominous. We did a lot of thunder sounds with them because it's. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I was amazed how they stood up to it. Do you use like a set? Uh, the sound field recorder? Yes, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, <coughs> the sound field, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the um, SC450 is the one with the new um, sound field microphone. Um, I tried recording, the problem is with that, that system is really good at getting spontaneous recordings because you keep the microphones on the coat hanger. You very quickly do that. It takes you a few minutes to rig a sound field microphone, by which time in wildlife it's gone. You know, whatever's, whatever's happening has stopped, particularly thunder and things. So this is a real good grab and go device. And these days also with the, a lot of digital recorders, they have a pre-record buffer. So it's constantly recording um, 10 seconds and then dumping it and picking it up. So when you press record, it downloads the previous 10 seconds which makes life much easier for me. Um, I used to miss all that. I used to make all my best recordings on leader tape when I was recording <laughs> that. Um, but now with the buffer, it's great, you know, so you, you've no excuse for missing anything. And because in the animal world, there's a lot of behavior you can't predict, or, you know, thunder. So you can hear the thunder and then press record and providing the microphones where up and you'll grab the sound. Where, where, whereabouts did you use your parabolics? All over. Um, th that recording was in Iguazu, in the, on the border of Brazil and Argentina. Oh, was, was indoors, outdoors. Oh, see, I, I would never use it indoors. It's not a, there's no call, you know, call to use it. You know, it's an outside device that you would use in a place um, where you've got a distant sound source, which is a bird in the tree canopy. We were in St George's Square this afternoon and um, somebody was at Kirsty was recording robins that were singing. We got a great recording of a bird that we could hardly see you know, up in the canopy. Perfect subject for a, a parabolic reflector. Yeah, I used to use a parabolic myself with an SM58. Oh yeah, yeah, with a dynamic microphone, yeah. yeah. I've got a funnel company, that's why. Oh wow, yeah. And it's, it's correct and say that the, the camera should face in the way to this That's way. right, yeah. yeah. So you've got to direct it through it, right? Yeah, absolutely right, yeah. And cutting out the direct, uh, surround sound to give you directional sound, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely <laughs> correct, yeah. The SM58 is a cardioid microphone, so you always... 
point it into the yeah. dish perversely because you're, you're trying to collect sounds that are reflected off the surface and it's then reflect, effectively dead to sounds at the back. That's what we have always used. Yeah, that. that's exactly the way to use it. I mean, it's a heavy microphone to put in a reflector, an SM58. Um, you, you know, as I was saying today, what you don't do is that, because your arm will last about Maybe 30 seconds. Long. So you have to sort of adopt this sort of posture. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that in public. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank okay, you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks.